spinning back to the open side. For Mbete. Up the goal here for Samu, who's quick. Pete Samu looking for Kuro Mbete. Back to Samu. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wild. That is amazing from the Wallabies. Hello and welcome to Pick and Drive Rugby, where the people's podcast providing a platform for rugby lovers to come together and support the game that's played in heaven. I'm your host, Ando, and tonight is a bittersweet moment. The last hope of Australian rugby, the ACT Brumbies have been knocked out of the Super Rugby Finals, but we do have a very special guest with us, Joey Howey, Brumbies aficionado and a lover of all things Lord Laurie. How are you, mate? How are you doing after a tough loss? Uh, I'm going really well, thank you. Uh, it was a tough loss, but they acquitted themselves very well on, in tough conditions against a very, very good side. So, yeah, very. it is what it is. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So well, I'll take Mate. the win last week. <laughs> Mate, that was a, a strong win last week, and it was actually a really good performance in, in a lot of areas from the Brumbies, but we'll get into that in due course. I will give our apologies from both Mitch and Lockie. Uh, Mitch is on holidays. Lockie had work, and... Uh, there's no finer way to replace them with bringing Joey on. So thanks for being available, mate. But tonight, we are going to talk through the Super Rugby Pacific semifinals, as you would expect. We'll start with the Crusaders and the Blues before focusing in a bit more depth on the Chiefs versus the Brumbies. And then we've had uh, some locker room questions come in from Mitch Rev Evans. Uh, it was a late call for locker room questions on our Discord channel. So he sent through a few, which will be good fun to chat through. And then lastly, before we get into things, as always, we have two simple calls to action. Join our Discord channel to be a part of the best Australian rugby community going around, and the link is on any of our social media profiles. And then please consider going to ko-fi.com slash pickanddriverugby and supporting us with a one-off or monthly payment. Now, Joey, you're in our Discord channel, and you have recently had a pretty uh, shiny addition to your username on Discord. Can you um, explain what is on your username and what it signifies? Uh, this is awkward because I don't like to pump my own tyres up. But <laughs> uh, I basically got carried through our uh, draft Super Rugby comp by Mark Talaya. So, um, yeah, he basically blitzed the field every week and he carried me to the title. So thanks, Mark. So I so now have, yeah, I've now got a little crown emoji next to my name. Yeah. Excellent. So um, people on Discord would have noticed that Andy previously had the crown um, emoji on next to his name. So he won the 2022 edition. Joey is the victor of 2023. And so Andy will eventually change his over to having a star to recognize the fact that he has won a chance championship before much like the uh kind of european titles that happen over in different european comps um interestingly friend of the pod alex north or northy came dead last and we are still waiting for his punishment submission i won't give away too much of what it is but it will definitely be a dramatic uh performance of some sort that we will be happily posting online so we'll be chasing him up in the coming days but without any further ado Let's head into the Crusaders versus Blues. Let's go. We'll move now into the first Super Rugby semi final, which was the Crusaders hosting the Blues. And it was an absolute shellacking, a pumping of the Blues by the Crusaders 52 to 15. And Joe, I got to ask did you really see this match going any other way than a Crusaders victory? Uh, I thought they'd win. They've never lost a final at home, so they were always on the cards for a win, but I don't think anyone surely saw them winning by that margin. That's a uh, proper pantsing. So, yeah, didn't see that coming. No, I don't think many people did. I think you're right insofar as the uh, expectation was that the Crusaders were going to be getting a win. But I, um, I've i been under-impressed by the Blues this season. I, whilst the Crusaders also haven't had the best season, they they uh, had a few blips in their performances, a few injuries to key players that they didn't always manage particularly effectively. Uh, the Blues had been really failing to convince me. And maybe part of that was the fact that I selected Kurt Eklund as my first fantasy pick, and he did absolutely nothing for me throughout the entirety of the season. Uh, so I ended up ditching him. 
but they just really struggled within this game. And one of the things that I wanted to unpack a little bit is maybe uh, some of the reasons why. Now, Joey, I know with the weekend that you've had, you focus primarily upon the Chiefs and Brumbies game. So I might speak to this one in a little bit Go more detail. It. But your boy Talaya, um, he was a, he, he didn't have his best game, mate. What, what do you say about that? Uh, it's okay. The uh, fantasy comp finished a couple of weeks ago, so all good. <laughs> so it's all good. Well, the yeah. reason why I say maybe he didn't have his best game was because he was actually clearly at fault for the first two Crusaders tries. Um, the opening try to Braden Enor in the third minute and then Lester Fanga and Nuku in the 12th. He he shot up out of the defensive line, um, leaving, I think it was Bryce Heem, um, kind of on his own against an overlap. And each time the Crusaders just held the ball for that extra half pump or half pass and then just kind of passed it behind him. And it just showed maybe a lack of defensive solidarity, which is maybe some of the reasons why he hasn't been selected more consistently for the All Blacks. Plus, they're just super stacked in the back three. Um, but really, the Blues were just clearly outmatched and outmuscled, particularly up front. They weren't able to match the physicality of the Crusaders. They dropped the ball a ridiculous amount of times within the opening kind of 15 to 20 minutes. And actually, by the 21st minute, it was 18-0. And the Blues didn't do anything good until the 25th minute, and then they got a penalty. So it was 18-3 to in the 25th minute. So by the end of the first half, 32-3 to against the Blues. The game was over. And yet again, we see the Crusaders through to another Super Rugby final. And i got to ask you, mate, what do the Chiefs have to do to stock yet another Crusaders title? Uh, probably do what they did in the two games earlier this season. Um, just play like that would probably do it. But no, <laughs> they've just got to match them up front, match that physicality, the intensity in the forward pack. The Crusaders, really, that's what they do once they get to the finals is they amp up the intensity up front and I think the Chiefs are well positioned to do that. They've probably got the second best forward pack or the best forward pack arguably in the comp so um, yeah with a, you know they got all black slitted through their forward pack and back row so I think they're well positioned to do it and they've got an electric back line so just keep doing what they're doing uh, really. They're, yeah if anyone can do it it'll be the Chiefs. I completely agree. And one of the players I think will be making a big impact, for, at least for the Crusaders, and this is probably like one of the most obvious statements going around, but is Will Jordan. His um, involvement in his 35th minute try was just a thing of absolute beauty. He'd been over on the right-hand side um, on a previous phase, being an option for an, for an attack that went into a ruck. And then he cuts back in to the left-hand side, runs a, um, runs a line just under or behind Richie Malunga, who gets the ball, and just accelerates into space and goes around the covering uh, defenders. It was his, his ability to just accelerate off a dime was a massive, massive factor within that try. And it kind of leads really nicely when we talk about stacked New Zealand teams into the 2023 All Blacks uh, Rugby Championship squad announcement. So I'm not going to go through and name every single player, but I will read out the players who are uncapped that have been included in the squad because I think that's particularly interesting. And then I might throw it to you for a few points of difference. So we've got the absolute man mountain that is Tamaiti Williams from the Crusaders. Sam Penny Finau has been rewarded for an incredible season that he's had. Cam Roygaard as well has jumped a few places and has stepped up as one of the form uh, scrum halves of the New Zealand competition. Dallas McLeod and Emoni Narawa are also in there. So we've got five uncapped players in the squad with um, some pretty big names being left out, some through injury and some just through non-selection. So when this squad came out, were there any, uh, any players who were included or any omissions that were particularly notable for you, mate? Um, I think the big one is, it's probably worth noting straight off the bat, <clears throat> um, Sean Stevenson is in the squad as injury cover for Mark Talia. Correct, um, yeah. So it's interesting that he wasn't in the full squad, though, given the season that he's had. But uh, he will be uh, turning up for All Blacks training after the Super Rugby Grand Final next week. Uh, the big one, looking at the halfbacks, Finlay Christie getting picked is an interesting one um, over Brad Weber and Falau Fakataba. Um, that's, you know, a bit interesting, maybe, maybe not. Um, 
probably suggest I'd maybe think Roy Guard's number two on that depth chart behind Smith. Other than that, uh, the other big one is uh, the leaving out or the exclusion of uh, Levi Amua mm. uh, and the selection of Dallas McLeod. McLeod's had a really good season for the Crusaders. So there's no issue there, but I think most people would have thought that we would have tipped our Moa to be in the team given that, or in the squad at least, given that he's signing with the Crusaders next year. So uh, that that's in, an interesting one. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens with that later in the year, but they were probably the two big ones that stood out to me. An interesting uh, point that comes from this discussion is the eternal question over the 10-15-23 axis for the All Blacks. And at this stage, who do you think is a front runner for the 10 position out of Mawanga, Barrett and McKenzie? Uh, oh, I think it's Richie Mawanga. It will okay, be then at 15. Uh, oh, they, I don't know. They probably should pick someone else uh, but they'll might pull up i don't know yeah i don't think it should be i don't think it should be Bowden barrett i think no. he should be either the 23 or not in the squad but um they probably will do that because they're scared they won't be scared to it's a weird it's a weird thing not to pick him in the squad if you've got him but i don't think they should but anyway uh, yeah i yeah, think unfortunately um... I, unfortunately though, i don't know whether that gets mckenzie into the 15 or not Oh, look, it, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because, um, yeah. okay, in my mind, I'll, I'll tell you my my picks and then tell me what you reckon. So yeah. Mawanga at 10, 15, clearly Will Jordan in my mind. Yeah. He just He's literally the best fullback in the Southern Hemisphere, in my opinion. Um, and then you go Damien McKenzie at 23. And out of that, Bowden Barrett's the one that misses out in my mind. I think he's been pretty poor this season. I don't think he's been... Uh, anywhere near as good as Mawanga and McKenzie, and Will Jordan's just clearly a better 15. I don't have a problem with that. I just don't like the idea of them picking Jordan. I don't want to see it. Because <laughs> he's so good? He's just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just one of those players that, like, despite the fact that he's absolutely incredible, I just can't hate him because I like no, him no. too much as a player. Yeah, he's, he's just he's so a freak. good. He's just yeah. so good. Well, on that note, let's move across now into the next semi-final, which was the Chiefs versus the Brumbies. And unfortunately for you, my friend, and your beloved Brumbies, they went down 19-6 to in what was an incredibly closely fought, brutal defensive encounter with only Brody Retallick's 78th minute try sealing the game really for the Chiefs. So why don't we start actually before the game? And have a bit of a chat about how you were feeling in a lead up to this. So how confident were you of a positive result? And what did you think the Brumbies had to get right to upset the Chiefs going into the match? Um uh confident. I I, I don't know. Like you sort of it was one of those games where you don't the nice feeling probably of being the underdog. Like you're kind of like, well, I don't expect them to win. By rights, they shouldn't win. The Chiefs were the best team all season. They're playing at home. The record in Super Rugby of home teams in finals is exceptional. So you're sort of just thinking, oh, well, this, you know, they're a chance because the Brumbies are also a really good side. And I was confident that their best performance is good enough to win that game. But you're not expecting it. So it's sort of that sort mm. of a feeling where, I don't know, it just sort of takes the sting out of it a bit. They're not too, I wasn't nervous or anything about that. There's certainly other friends that were a bit more <laughs> worried, I suppose, yep. which is interesting. Um, getting right it was probably the things that they did get right. You got to get your defence right. You got to kick well. You got to play, try and play rugby in the right parts of the field. And I think they they did all that very well. It's just the Chiefs are the best defensive team in Super Rugby. I'm pretty sure. If they're not, they're the second best. They're so breaking them down, particularly in greasy conditions, was always going to be really, really tough. So um, yeah, I thought they had the. The game to do it, it was just about being able to execute on the night, which they, yep. unfortunately they just weren't quite able to do. No, they weren't. And it was an interesting first half. Uh, I think there was some criticism in terms of the amount of kicking that was happening within the first half. I think it was a case of both teams wanting to play in the right areas of the field and to back their defence to be able to hold firm in the, uh, in the face of the attack from the other team. And I think for the most part, that that happened. It was an incredibly strong defensive performance, particularly from the Brumbies within the first half. Um, they had a little, some issues with ball retention and Tom Wright was 
basically just living up to everything that he's loved and hated for. But the Brumbies only went into the half 6-3 down, I believe, after stopping multiple phase plays and uh, holding the ball up over the line with a scrum in, what, the 42nd minute or something. So how did you rate the first half from the Brumbies? Uh, I'm just trying to remember now. It was No, the first half was good. It's funny, like, people whinge you at or complaining about kicking. It looked like it was very raining very heavily. So, like, I don't know. I thought the amount – and they kicked with the stats you just had up. I think it was apparently 60 times or 65 times for the game or yep, something 65. total. Correct. Which, when you think about how many times they kicked last – the Reds and the Chiefs kicked the week before, it's still 30 less. So, they're doing an awful lot of ball in hand as well. Um, and, yeah, I, I, there was, I thought it was a really enthralling – first half of rugby there was massive patches of ball in play um where yeah there was a lot of kicking but there was a lot of it was it's like i think it felt like like 10 minutes worth at one point of just the ball didn't go out there was no knock on so there's no stoppages or no penalties so there was just a lot and a lot going on so i found it a really enjoyable first half uh as for what they did well um Sorry, Pat Cummins just hit a six down the ground. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Um, uh, it was uh, stuff that they did well. Like, yeah, they played. They when they got down to the right end of the field, they were able to exert pressure on the Chiefs, and that pressure led to penalties, which gave them opportunities to convert into points. Unfortunately, Debrusini missed that first shot at penalty, um, which was a pretty straightforward kick. So that was disappointing. Mm. Um, in a night where you knew that points were going to be at a premium. They then obviously, I think they went to the corner and they came away empty-handed. And then in between all that, I think that's when Deborah Sandy might have been concur- failed, yeah. went off for a HIA and then uh, Lalesio kicked a penalty. So they were able to get down there and they were getting points. They probably didn't get as many as they would have liked from those opportunities. Um, you're right, the defence at the end of the game, the Chiefs, they're just so good. They You're like, they will find gaps at some point mm-hmm. um so they defended that really really well um some of that was self-inflicted um through poor execution from being kind of the line dropout um, <laughs> um you look at it stuff- again i'm just going to jump in on that point though i watched it again because i actually missed the first half because i was i was actually in canberra with my family and doing a few family things and i only tuned in for the second half and i, I was seeing all this outrage on twitter so i went back and watched it and if i'm being incredibly generous i love the ambition of what he was trying to do there and it was just that it was incredibly well read by the chief yeah. defender who got executed. up really well um so I don't well, hate was... I don't hate the decision. It's like I don't hate the decision, but it's one of those things where if it goes wrong, you look like a goose. And unfortunately, and like it went wrong, so you look like a goose. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, it's just the poor poor execution, which is that's for fine. They defended it fortunately, and yeah, they were well positioned going into the second half um, of the game. Yeah, but I really enjoyed the, the first half. I thought it was really enthralling game it wasn't it wasn't like a yeah it was one for the purists but it was it was I enjoyed watching it yeah and look the thing that um really impressed me about uh the first half and then obviously shifting cross into the second was just the defensive integrity that both teams were um were showing but also in that regard it was the the pressure that both teams were putting on the opposition all over the field. So the ruck pressure was yeah. immense. And multiple times the Brumbies have got into really, really good positions um, up in the Chiefs' end of the field. And it's either been through immense ruck pressure has forced a little knock on or a bobble or the ball spilled out from yeah. the ruck or the Chiefs have competed in the air and got a turnover at the line out. There's just been these moments where either team has been able to upset and unsettle the opposition. So you haven't seen as much continuity in attacking phase play as a, as um, as some people might want to see. But that doesn't mean it's a bad game or a scrappy game. And I think that's one of the challenges that people may have thought of when they were watching particularly the first half. Yeah. Oh, I just, I thought the given the conditions, the ball handling was excellent. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought... The Brumbies were getting some good 
reward from con- the contestable kicks that they were putting up. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I thought it was all going like pretty well. It was literally a kick and goal that they missed. That yeah. they should have been six all. It could have been six all at half time. Um, yeah. Well, then coming into this, then we get into the second half, and there are no points scored for the first or oh, fourteen. I think the first penalty was in the fifty fourth minute to yeah. Damien McKenzie, and then fifty eighth to Noel Lucio, bringing the gap back down to three points between them until no, Damien McKenzie. Yes, uh, Damien McKenzie steps up in the 72nd minute and kicks. I saw um, some articles saying it was a 48-metre kick, and I'm like, that oh, was no. like 49.5. It was oh, huge. 49.8, even. It was like only a few inches over halfway. Oh, yeah, it was a massive it was amazing. nudge. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. It was a real, it was a, yeah, it was a bit of a, just a brawl, really. It was just mm. like they were just flying into each other. Um, it was just a real grind and a, yeah, it was, yeah, it was full on. It was really physical, a real grind. Um, yeah, no one could really get anywhere. As soon as someone would make half a break, you're right. Like there'd be a turnover or something like that. Or yeah, it just became a real slog. In that I think that, half. um, a part of that came from just the refereeing approach that Nick Berry had to the game. I don't think that he had any impact upon the outcome. I thought he did a decent job and was fair towards both teams, but he was allowing a pretty, uh, a pretty brutal melee at the ruck time. And oh, there are a few times where I've seen players, <laughs> I've I've seen players come in what from what I would have pretty clearly have said is a side, but he was kind of letting it go for both teams. Yeah. Um, and it was just a real free-for-all at the right time, and Nick Berry was just letting it happen. Yeah. Um, I'd, yeah. he's. I've always found that Nick Berry, that's Nick Berry's approach to Ruck, so that's fine. It's always the same for both teams. Yep. You just got to um, get your shoulders on and hook into it. I think the selection um, from the Brumbies actually played really well into that. So having Hooper at six, Samu at seven, and then Valentini at eight meant they had a giant, giant back row. Um, and when you're yeah. adding in Caden Neville into that equation with his just love for all things uh, physical and dark, it was a really abrasive pack that the Brumbies, Brumbies had. But I just feel like um, some of the difference came from players like Brody Retallick and Peter Gossowakua as well yeah. they're just uh, in my mind just p- particularly Brody Retallick is a step above um, either of the Brumbies locks and his turnover in the kind of 70 it was kind of with in the last 10 minutes of the game he got a really crucial turnover um, which gave possession to the Chiefs and stopped a really promising Brumbies attack he's just one of those players who in the last couple of weeks has just said no 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 we're, we're going to win this we're going to win this title and I'm going to drag the whole team along yeah, well, it means uh, he's one of the best second rowers in the world. World Cup winner, 100 caps for the All Blacks. Yeah, mm-hmm. big games, the best players step up and he's definitely one of them and he'll be one of those key players next week when they play the Crusaders. And actually that be. might be, if Whitelock's not back, which I don't think he will be, that's a big tick towards the Chiefs. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So why don't we talk now? Um, obviously, Retallick was one of the key players. Peter Gossow, cool as well, had a really crucial turnover, um, which uh, gifted a lot of opportunities for, well, a big opportunity for the Chiefs to pour on pressure um, onto the Brumbies. But who were some of the key players for the Brumbies that you thought had a good game, considering, obviously, that they eventually went down? Uh, yeah, the usual suspects, I suppose. Slipper was excellent. Um Neville was great in tight again. So was Frost, just work rate. Tom Hooper got through a mountain of work. Valentini, just the amount of work he gets through and the way, I think, just later in games, he almost like mm. builds into them like a, a bit of a wave because <clears throat> um, he did it the week before as well. It was like the last 10 minutes he was going somehow harder than he was in the first. It's, it's unbelievable. But I think Nick White, that was probably, that was a classic Nick White game just controlled everything, milk, like smart heads up plays, got a couple of penalties advantages for players offside at the rack. Mm-hmm. Um, his kicking was like, was spot on. He was, yeah, really, really, really good. 
Yep. Yep. So let's let take a look at Valentini's stats. So he had 15 carries, 39 yep. meters made with three defenders beaten. Adding on to that, he also had 18 tackles with only one missed. So yep. you had a few other players stepping up in the defensive stats as well. You had Caden Neville, 19 and one missed. Tom Hooper, 16 and three missed. Um, you had Nick Frost make 16 tackles, but he actually missed seven of them. So he had one of his uh, weaker defensive performances in that regard. Lockie won again, 17 and none. So defensively, there were some really strong performances as well. And it just shows that when it's two quality teams going at each other, it's just these little moments that make the difference. And Damien McKenzie's um, break to eventually put Brody Retallick over the line was the thing that kind of broke the back in the 78th minute. And when that went, went over, you just knew it was done by that point. Not enough time yeah. to come back. But I think what this leads to incredibly well is hey. the locker room because the locker room um, was put up a little bit later this week. Uh, I've been away and everybody else is away as well. So it was just a quick throw out on Discord. And Mitch Rev Evans came back with three questions for us. And we're going to touch on number one, then number three, then number two. So question number one, what or when was the turning point of the match for the Brumbies in your opinion? Uh, I think it was that 50 metre penalty. Mm. That was the, they put it out beyond a converted try. And that was where it's like, uh, that's in these conditions with the time left. I don't think we're scoring twice. So that was yeah i think that was the 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 nail in the coffin the turning point up until that it was a real it was just a slog and it was always going to come down to sort of either one them getting just that bit ahead which they did there or the brilliant one moment of play which was then the mckenzie break like you spoke about just before mm. late in the game so it was always going to come down to something like like that and i think the reason that that really hurt was then that forced the Brumbies to start really pushing stuff. And it just, that's too hard in those conditions. Like it, you know, Again, pushing such a good team as well. yeah, it's, yeah, it's just hard. Um, so yeah, it's, that would be my turning point. That was where it was like, oh, I think that's the game done and dusted. So I never knew he, he had those meters in him. I didn't think he'd be able to kick it from what was essentially 50 meters. Oh, well, yeah, he went 50 meters. I think it, was like most of the way the dead ball line when it landed. So mm. he definitely mm. had the range for it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, no, a, just that's trying... a defeated sound if I've ever well, heard one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I was just trying to think of times Damian McKenzie's kicked 50 meters of penalty goals. I'm like, no, oh, I don't remember. I any. Have. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, question number three. Was 2023 an improvement on 2022 from a Brumbies perspective? And just how excited should fans be about the return of Stephen Larkin? Um, I think it's a it's improvement. Well, it's on the score sheet, it's not. They finished three. Well, I'd say they finished third now um, after the Blues loss on Friday night. I don't think they can mm. claim third. So, like, I'd say they finished third, which is probably about where they finished last year. Um, they played a lot different this year, though, as well. I think Larkham's put in a more, uh, I suppose, expressive attack pl attacking plan. Um, they've been, a, yeah, played with more width, more counter, more counter attack. We've seen some really brilliant tries from the Brumbies this year. So mm. I, I think it's an evolution. It's sort of like, I always find they just sort of build on these building blocks and just tweak things. So, I don't know. I think there's reason to be excited by it from Larkham's return. It was a bit concerning. I think they've sort of gone improved in the attack, but the defence got worse. And so it's yeah. sort of like, okay, can we fix up the defence? Because you want to do be good to keep the defence as good as it was and then improve the attack. But, um, yeah, I think there's reasons to be excited. I think they're, they're, looking, they're looking good. They're still retaining... The vast majority of their core group, even with, I think it's seven players, five or five to seven players leaving, I think next year. So, yeah, I think there's reasons for optimism and excitement for season 2024. 
One of my concerns, um, looking at the Brumby setup, is the loss of coaching IQ that's happening. Well, so yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> um, Lord Laurie retiring after a well-deserved and incredible career at the Brumbies, and you got Dan Palmer as well. That's I think he's joining. Um, he's joining over at Leicester Tigers. Yeah, uh, Dan McKellar over at Leicester Tigers. So that that's pretty concerning. That basically the coaching team from last year has entirely gone, essentially. Uh, yeah, uh, I think the attack coach is staying, though. I can't recall his name. Um, ben Mullen's coming in, I think, to replace mm -hmm. Palmer. So it's they always sort of keep that Brumby's ID, though. They don't sort of bring in people from outside of the, the family, I suppose. So the cult, the I'm not too worried about it. And, I mean, I know everyone. He's only retired from full-time coaching, Laurie, so he'll probably end up still there. Yep. Quite a bit. Who knows? On a, on a um, so who, who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, just, you know, you can't quit some things. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, yeah, it is. That's a huge loss when you think of it. He's been there for 20 odd years. It's, um, it's going to be hard. You can't replace that. You just got to do it in the collective, but I'm sure they'll be okay. It's, I'll overcome that. Yeah. 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 Well, mate, I think that leaves us now to the final question that Rev asked that we want to cover. And his question was, how many and which Brumbies will be going to South Africa for the rugby championship opener, both in the squad and then in the 23? So we actually spent some time before we hit record putting this together. And we've got a slide up with what players or which players we think will be in the match day 23 as well as those that are in the rugby championship squad. So I'm going to read them out for everybody, especially those who are audio listeners. So the match day 23, we suspect that it will have James Slipper, Alan Alalatoa, Nick White, Rob Valentini, Len Ikatau, Nick Frost, and Pete Samu. You could pretty justifiably argue for Caden Neville or Lockie Lonigan in the 23 as well, but we, we thought not. And then in the Rugby ch Championship squad as a whole, obviously those aforementioned players and Caden Neville, Lockie Lonergan and Tom Wright as the likely players in the squad. And then maybe Ryan Lonergan, depending upon the size of the squad. And we think that Tom Hooper is a pretty uh, good chance to be like the renowned bolter. There's always a bolter in every squad, um, or at least there should be to make it fun. And we think Tom Hooper will be that bolter. So do you think we were, um, how one-eyed do you think we were in putting this together, mate? Uh, no, this is based on performance. The Brumbies are the best performed team, so they should have the highest representation. Um, <laughs> this is a completely objective. Uh, completely objective, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no subjectivity included. Uh, no, I, like I think, Guys that we've got in that match day twenty three are all like near dead certainties. I can't um, like they and they have been for the last since Rennie took over pretty well, or since they've debuted in the instances yep. of like in the yep. instance of Frost and Nicky Tower. Um, I think the bigger questions are on the fringes or on the other things. Like I know well, there's a lot of conjecture at the moment. It seemed like there must have been a whole bunch of people sitting at home with knives being sharpened for Tom Wright all season, just mm. waiting for him to have a bad game. And it's just like, right, we can knife him now. So it's been, I think, pretty overblown in some quarters, the response to his performance. I think I, I at the, this stage, he'd still be the 15 um, for me. So I'd have him in the match day 23. And that's purely because he's the best performed. Um, you could go with a, a perceived safer option, but I kind of always think of it as, are you trying to win games or not lose games? And yep. I think Tom Wright's a selection that means that you're trying to win the game. Yes, he might make mistakes. All players make mistakes. The guy that we're probably going to pick at fly half, Quay Cooper, kick the kick the first the kickoff in the in a World Cup semi final out on the full. Like <laughs> it happens. People do have brain farts and make massive mistakes um the way tom wright's played this year i think is worthy of at least him getting a first look at that position yep. um and then going forward from there uh the, neville may or may not be in there and that'll probably just depend on the overseas picks and isaac rodder's potential fitness uh and lonigan i mean there's probably eight hookers you could pick in australian rugby 
<laughs> they're all about that. And that's that's been a problem throughout the whole Rennie era, yeah. the number yeah. of hookers that have been chosen. But that is a conversation for another time. So um, what I would like you to do, dear listeners, is to basically roast us if you think that our – uh, decisions are biased or incorrect here, uh, especially about Tom Wright. For me, I'd actually be having him at 15 as well. So I don't think it's just Joey that has that opinion. Um, you can also uh, blame me too. So <laughs> I would <laughs> love some comp- conversation, love some uh, competition about who you think will be in that team. Uh, the match day squad should be getting released uh, within, an, sorry, not the match day squad, the rugby championship squad should be getting released in about a week's time, I believe. Yeah. Um, so very much looking forward to that. And Joe, I think that brings us to the end of the pod, mate. It's been great having you on. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Awesome, mate. Well, I think you are the most representative uh, fantasy draft player on the pod, so congratulations. Uh, it's been a wow. pleasure having you on and representing the that's, fantasy team and also... That's also performance-based, isn't it? Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, mate, thank you again. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure being with you. Um, we'll see if any of the other people who claim to be a part of the Pick and Drive Rugby team will be available next week. We'll see how that goes. But it has been an absolute pleasure. So have a wonderful week and we'll speak to you next time. Bye.